Okay. All right. So uh, Bruno and Athlete, should we move on to, uh, to uh, Eduardo? Sounds good. Okay. Excitement's building. All right. Is everybody ready? Has everyone gone and got their coffee? If you're working from home, even if you're working in the office, go get your coffee. All right. On to the, on to the show. Okay. Um, so Eduardo, uh, I will uh, uh, turn, uh, turn this uh, discussion over. You're, you're, you're done hearing from me for a while. I'll turn it over to uh, my good colleague, uh, uh, David, uh, who's now driving my, my computer. And uh, David is going to tell us all about Eduardo. Thanks, Frank. Um, and I think, Frank, do you want to give a little bit of context about the name where Eduardo comes from first? Yes. All right. So everyone wants to know, uh, what is this Eduardo business? Well, of course, it's the emergency dashboard utility for Air Force resource and delivery options. Um, sorry, did I just jump back there? Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, uh, I was trying to minimize my uh, screen there. Um, so why uh, why is it uh, this uh, this big uh, acronym? Well, there's 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 two there's two reasons behind it. One is it really is a dashboard that you can look at Air Force uh, Air Freight resource and delivery options, but it's really as a um, as a uh, an acknowledgement of our former LET colleague uh, Eduardo Martinez, who was president of the UPS Foundation. And he worked, uh, you know, we worked with, Eduar with, with Eduardo Martinez for, uh, for close to the entire duration of the partnership, about 13 or 14 years. And he was such a great guy. And uh, we wanted to make sure that he retired, you know, he retired last year. We wanted to make sure that he had an enduring legacy with the LET. This is our LET partnership. We really do have a, have a, good, a lot of good fun with each other. Um, so we built this dashboard and then we said, okay, let's name it for Eduardo Martinez. Uh, so uh, you can thank Eduardo Martinez for all his contributions to the LET uh, and to the humanitarian communities uh, whenever you uh, use this application, if you do, if you do use it. Um, but that's the background on it. Uh, we, we certainly wish Ed the best of success and we wanted to thank him and recognize all the efforts and contributions that he provided to the LET uh, via our great partners at, uh, at UPS. So that's the background on it. And you can call it Ed for short. We did, we call them Ed for short. So it's the emergency dashboard. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Over to you, David. Awesome, thanks, Alice. Hi everyone, my name is David Wu. Um, I've been the team lead for the volunteers from both UPS and Agility that helped to create Eduardo. Uh, really excited to talk to everyone today. A little bit of background about myself. I'm a data scientist in the advanced technology group at UPS um, and basically have years of experience creating value uh, through data science and data visualization. Um, I'm excited to present Eduardo, a web-based application uh, that we hope will uh, increase the visibility into available air transit options, as well as reduce the time and resources spent for humanitarians. Um, and, and I'll note that Eduardo is designed specifically with humanitarians in mind. Some of the motivation uh, for Eduardo. Uh, across the board, COVID has uh, highlighted the gaps and vulnerabilities in our system. Um, and specifically with air transit, we, we saw that uh, starting in March 2020, uh, there was wide scale stoppages, uh, airports closed, uh, countries restricted what they would export. Um, and these conditions changed almost on a daily basis and, and could vary across regions and countries. Um, and so that impacted all humanitarian operations. Um, and the logistics cluster reached out to the LAT for support to provide this uh, updated air cargo constraint and capacity information. And, and to start, uh, the LET met uh, this call to action. Uh, uh, led by my colleagues at Agility, Maria Cementwala, Sami Salame, and Alan Silatoy. So uh, they, in fact, did uh, provide some of this information. They were able to reach out to operations teams, uh, manually track down information and, and compile it into these spreadsheets that you see on the right um, to, to a very uh, full extent. Um, but as we know, with the ever-changing conditions, uh, the amount of data that was required, um, this process took, at some estimates, about 20 hours 
of um, volunteer time from, from Maria and the agility team, Alan and, and Sammy. And so while they might not say it's unsustainable, uh, there, there's an opportunity here to leverage automation and data analytics so that their efforts can be um, better used somewhere else, their expertise in, in logistics could be used somewhere else. And, and that's really where um, I think the project took root. And that's where uh, our data team from UPS came in. And so um, really all credit goes to, to the volunteer team of um, agility folks and UPSers with their extensive data background um, and logistics background. Um, this started in April, 2020, um, and we were able to build a data processing and visualization tool that will be able to be used for, for COVID relief, but as well um, as kind of a foundation that can be built on for subsequent humanitarian emergencies, um, all with the goal of helping to accelerate the movement of humanitarian relief um, and, and to save lives. Um, I wanna highlight that the work, uh, we're, we're all remote, met over Zoom, um, and we we're doing this work during uh, lunches, nights, and weekends. And so I really want to um, extend a thanks to, to all the UPS team members um, and agility team members who, who volunteered their time uh, for this project. Just at a high level, um, none of this, uh, this project owes a debt of gratitude as well to our friends at Google who uh, volunteered and, and gave uh, the data to us for free. Um, so we're, we're leveraging the flight data from Google um, and, and that allows us to have automatic uh, daily updates of the flight data uh, between these predetermined origin destinations. And I alluded to that Eduardo was designed for humanitarians. Um, and so uh, with consulting the logistics cluster, uh, we, we came up with our initial set of origin and destination airports. Some of these are UN uh, depots. Um, some of the other ones are, are uh, the destinations are, are identified in the humanitarian response plan. Um, and additionally, it's adaptable and scalable to any sudden onset emergencies um, through a process where we modify queries that include additional airports. Um, and, and Maria will get into that later where we are able to test out with um, with the select members uh, of the logistics cluster for uh, some emergencies in, in January, 2021. Um, and so this is the data back end of it. On the front end, uh, we have the visualization tool, um, which will uh, allow you to look at flight schedules and information between uh, a destination and origin pair or one origin and many destinations and many origins to one destination. Um, and so without uh, going on and on, I feel like the best way to, to understand it is to demo it. And in that case, I'll let Maria uh, cement while I take over and, and give a demo. Hi, uh, so uh, uh, Maria, so I'll, I'll reintroduce uh, Maria to everybody. Maria is, uh, is uh, my colleague from our Agility uh, India and uh, She's been in the industry for, for many years. Um, I would estimate that she's probably moved millions of tons of cargo throughout her career. Um, she manages our, uh, our uh, Asia to South Asia uh, trade lane program uh, in, uh, in agility, but she's also done branch management. She's managed different products and product lines uh, and services uh, in her career uh, with agility as well as with other organizations. So she's a, she's a uh, a big advocate for humanitarianism and uh, has been uh, engaging with me and the LET partnership and the human, our humanitarian assistance program also for, for a number of years. Um, and she also leads our, our CSR program in India. She does a lot of great stuff with, with schools. Um, she brings solar power to schools and things like that. She does uh, tutoring and, and education. She did a lot of work to keep uh, schools running in a few different communities uh, during COVID. Um, so, uh, that's Maria. And then on the call also is, is Alan Silito. And Alan Silito comes from a, our Canada organization. He's also been in the industry for many years. His specialty is he does kind of a fair a, a event logistics. So Alan's the, the person you call if you want to move a professional sporting team or an orchestra or a, um, a Broadway show and move it around the, the world and put it on tour and stuff. He's the one that does all the 
uh, the logistics and flight planning and things of that nature behind that, that, kind of, that kind of work. So it's very, very similar to the humanitarian context. It's you know, high priority, high value, um, sometimes chartering, uh, cargo flights that's, uh, that, that need to get moving you know, right away under, under, under very uh, critical circumstances. So Alan and Maria were our operational leads on this, our operational leading volunteers. So I wanted to let you guys know that it, it, it wasn't me who came up with this stuff. It was actually people who know what they're doing. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to, to uh, Maria. Uh, do you want me to stop sharing, Maria? Would you like to start sharing? I think I've already started sharing. Uh, can you see the screen? No, I'm still, I'm still sharing it. Um, Bruno, we can have Maria share the screen, right? If not now, in a second. Yep, there we go. All right. All right. Can you can you look at the Eduardo screen right now? Yes, yes. Maria, you can see your screen. All right. So good day to everybody from India, and. Uh, I, uh, Frank, I should say thank you for having me on this project. And uh, it has been great working across uh, the seas with uh, the UPS team on this project with David and all. Coming to uh, the uh, Eduardo, uh, we are, what, you, what we can go across is with four cases uh, on how the uh, dashboard will be helpful to us. I would take it from the first case, which would be which would be the major country of origins in today's situation, so which from where the shipments could be moving out. So if I look at a China, so you see there is this tab where you can filter down into origin destinations. So with the China, you see all the flights which are moving out from China into the various countries, and as uh, David mentioned, these are specific destinations which have been mapped as of now, and specific origins, which are UHRD origin depots, major supply countries, which have been identified, major destinations as of now, which have been identified. Now, uh, when you hover over this map, you can have a little bit more information on which are the countries for which presently a China into that specific country you can have information on. If you move over across to this tab, which is the focus mode, it can give you more details on the duration, which is the shortest flight, the longest flight duration. Now coming into specifics. So from China, if we want to look at a shipment moving into Ethiopia. There you go. Now, one thing which you will see the map is just showing a direct country to country. It does not necessarily show the actual routing. The countries for China, uh, in China, the country uh, airports which have been identified were the four major airports of China, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Xi'an. In Ethiopia, it's Addis Ababa. The flight schedules, if you hover over that, you will see that you can see two flight schedules. That means this is a transshipment. And that's exactly what I meant that though this will show as a single line, it's actually a transshipment, which depends on based on the airline. You can see a direct flight when you just see a single flight. So you can see it's Ethiopian Airlines, which is a single flight moving in from PVG into Addis Ababa. This is the first example. The second one where you can look at is the major airport hubs. So the major airport hubs, which we could identify with African countries as a major destination. So we take Ethiopia as one of the options. So you will have a lot of cargo moving into the Ethiopian hub. And then from there, it could connect into various flights. And that's what reflects on the screen out here. So from Ethiopia, all that the flights can move around to the destinations. I will give a small example, which is of South Sudan. So you're from Addis Ababa to South Sudan. You may have a direct flight quite a few direct flights which are there. 
plus you will have some transshipment flights. The next example of a major hub airport would be UAE with a lot of airlines getting cargo into UAE. And you can see from here, from UAE as an origin airport country, the way the flight schedules which are available as of now. I would take an example somewhere in the South Asia. So let me take a Myanmar as an example now. So again, like I mentioned, though it's a straight line, there could be a possibility of a transshipment. So here you go. You'll have options out of Abu Dhabi, out of Dubai, into Rangoon, into Myanmar. So it's a Malaysian airline flight. You have a Emirates flight with the departure dates, arrival, and a tentative duration time for the overall duration. The next case we would pick up are the UNHRD ports, depots. So if I have to identify the UNHRD depots, it would be majorly Italy, China, UAE, Ethiopia, uh, Ghana, Malaysia, Panama, and South Africa. If you have to pick up any of them, and at present I'll pick up Italy as an example. So from the UNHRD hub, from the depot, you will have various options moving into Africa, into Central America, into, into Australia, as well as if you see it's into Bangladesh as well. Similarly, from another hub port, which is in Spain, you will have these options available. Now we will get into a destination specific as how we could uh, leverage the tool on a destination specific. So um, there was a tropical storm in May 2020 in El Salvador. And when that happened, the first thing what was needed to see how we could have the aid arranged, the food, medicine, and aid to be arranged to the country. So if you look at destination country as El Salvador, the variety of options which are available on the various flights can reflect over here. And I would pick up an example over here of maybe a Canada. So Canada airports into El Salvador, the flight schedules, and you can see there is a direct flight which was moving in. So this is the information which as an operational person would want to look at. A second example I would look at of UNHRD depot, which is in Panama. So from Panama City into El Salvador, you have a transshipment option, plus you have direct flights with the duration updated. A second situation which we can give is in December 2020, when the cyclone Yasa hit Fiji. Again, it was the same situation to get information on the flight schedules which could, could be made available. And this tool helps in that kind of situation as well. So all, and if you see the limited countries, which are moving into Fiji as of now, it helps you identify immediately. So it's Australia, which is the nearest country, and New Zealand, which is the nearest country to Fiji. You have China, which is not only the depot, but also one of the major supply. You have UAE, which is again a depot plus an airline hub. And you have USA, which is a depot. In Fiji, I'll pick up an example of USA. So from Los Angeles into Fiji, you have all the shipments which are all via a transshipment. 
a second example which can actually give you more information could be like from australia you have much more in flights schedules moving in from australia and you also have direct flights into fiji so right now as i mentioned the origin countries which are covered are the major un depot hubs which have been identified by the cluster the major supply countries which have been identified for sending humanitarian aid the third one is the major airport hubs which were identified so that's why you could see ethiopia over here as a major airport hub we should we could see dubai over here and the destination countries were identified as which were foreseen as the major countries or the locations which would need a requirement for the humanitarian aid that is one second also we identified the hub airports which needed to be put as destination country so anything could move into the hub airports these were identified as such to create the tool um any questions anybody please feel free to ask thank you very much maria looks like we have a question from marie uh marie uh, go ahead thanks a lot for the presentation again impressive tool um one of the key elements when um we're trying to plan <coughs> at the beginning uh, of a sudden onset crisis is all about the, the reality of the flights because we have faced a lot of cases where the flights were planned but not, um, didn't happen. And so I was wondering whether, I've seen that there is some kind of history in the listing of the flights. And I was wondering whether it was a plan to add a feature to confirm whether the flight actually departed or not. Thank you. That's a that's an excellent question. Um, one thing to note is that uh, the, the Eduardo tool uh, provides us with, um, and I'll uh, share my screen again, the Eduardo tool provides us with um, uh, a two week window. Uh, so what's coming up in the next two weeks, it's based on scheduled information from carriers. So if the carriers haven't updated their, their flights, if they haven't said, okay, we're canceling all these flights, <clears throat> You, as a humanitarian, you use the tool, it gives you an indication. It, it, it narrows your parameters about who you can call to see if there's capacity available or who you can instruct your logistics provider. If you call up your logistics provider and say, hey, I can see that there's a few different uh, uh, carriers that are, that are, that are flying, um, give them a call. For additional features of historical information, that's a good thing to add if, if, if that would benefit the humanitarian communities. This is the first version of the application and it will uh, be improved over time. Um, so we'll work with the cluster to provide feedback. So any feedback you have, uh, that, uh, that's my response. I just realized I should probably have David answer that question. He's got his finger on the pulse of the, of the technology and data much more than I do. So uh, David, uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, in terms of historic, uh, basically whether, whether a scheduled flight in the past had actually departed or not, um, the way that we're feeding in data is basically we make a query call, say at 5 a.m. on a certain day, and then it will look at all flights from that point on in 14 days in advance. Um, I think it, it would be, if that's definitely something that's valuable for humanitarians to know, um, I think that would be good feedback to take and, and we, uh, there could be brainstorming on, on how to address that. I see, Frank, there was also a question whether there's a plan to add um, ocean and maritime uh, route data on it. So, Frank, if you want to go to the last slide of the presentation, I can answer that. Let me uh, share my screen real quick. And, uh, sorry. So, first, 
I do want to thank Maria and um, all of the data scientists and our supply chain experts who volunteered their time to work to bring this Eduardo to life. Um, the LET is nothing without the expertise of our people because they are the ones that do the work and help us do the work. Um, I am Alice Turner I'm with the EPS Foundation and one of the LET partners. And I want to talk about to that question and to uh, Marie's statement, the evolution and the big, big picture of what this tool is working to accomplish. So, you know, Frank talked in the beginning about the original planning tool, or um, David did, that was built as a supercharged spreadsheet. And so it evolved into this easier to use emergency dashboard. But the dashboard's definitely just laying the foundation for more to come. The tool as it is now is very helpful in planning air transport, um, but it does have its limitations, but it lays the foundational work for the um, for, for future evolutions of, of the tool. So the ultimate planning tool is already in process. Um, it's at its infant stage, but it will take the air freight planning tool and it will overlay it with ocean and rail delivery options. Um, and then also provide visibility to upstream and downstream disruptions and also any major um, capacity shifts. So the global supply system dashboard is a supply chain uh, and transport industry initiative. And that's also gonna be led by the World Economic Forum. Um, so what we're doing now is deploying Eduardo to all of our humanitarian organizations and then we will apply lessons learned from this tool to help the upcoming generations of the tool develop, including the WEF initiative of the Global Supply System Dashboard. Um, are there any other questions? I hope that you, you know, will go in and check out Eduardo and find it very helpful and also relay information back to us so that we can continue um, to develop with the larger WEF team. But we can open it up for additional questions if anybody has any. Any questions? Okay. Um, I, 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 uh, yes, Margie. Margie, go ahead. Uh, Mar Margie from the World Economic Forum. Hi, Margie. Hi, everybody. So, first of all, um, incredible, incredible work. And I know, Alice, you and the team um, from UPS, the agility team, um, have put a huge amount of work into this over the last 12 months. I think uh, as a foundational effort that demonstrates very visually uh, what is possible, and then in practice, what is possible, it is of immense value. So to your point about uh, foundational block, this is an incredibly important part of the work. And I think that um, all kudos go to the team. And from the World Economic Forum perspective, we've been thrilled to be working um, kind of in parallel, I would say, with you as we develop uh, the thinking around the global supply system dashboard in order to drive a greater supply chain resilience and supply system resilience uh, into the future using data and technology, um, applying more real-time and near, near real-time analytics to it as well. And I think that just for the humanitarian teams, the forum is very, very aware of the immense effort that goes into protecting and uh, serving citizens who are in far more vulnerable circumstances than most of us can even imagine. And so I think that the work that's being done here through a collaboration between the private and the public sector uh, is, is incredible. And we look forward to working with you to take this forward. But congratulations to the entire team from the World Economic Forum side. Um, and certainly I think that again, another first from the LET that is gonna make an incredible difference to those who are serving on the ground. Thanks, Marty. Uh, this is a, it's it's great. We're, we're we're always happy to work with the with the, the with the World Economic Forum. Um, you keep us plugged in, and you help bring a lot of benefit uh, to humanitarians. I, people don't 
uh, don't often recognize it, but uh, the, the World Economic Forum is instrumental in the, abil the ability for the LET to even work with the cluster. Um, so it's a, it's a great genesis of ideas and we look forward to continued uh, engagement with the forum on that global dashboard. Uh, this will be a, a foundational part of the program. We're very pleased about that. Uh, Mallory uh, uh, Freeman from UPS. Hi, Mallory, you have some questions too. Hi, yes, good morning and good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Just wanted to, to actually, the comment I was gonna make just ties extremely well to the, the points just brought up on the World Economic Forum side. So, you know, we're on a, a journey to, to use our data better, of course, within UPS, um, just in our normal day jobs. But what we, what, we, what we find is, you know, kind of first you're going after getting the data wrangled. And I think that's what this, um, this dashboard and this opportunity represents. And then from there, you're, you're building on that and going towards a way for actually driving insights and making better decisions. And, and towards that, you can bring in different types of algorithms and decision support and, and really just try to get to know where our pain points and work backwards from there. So, you know, th this dashboard takes into account kind of existing um, existing priorities for for the for the current situations that we're in we're going to expand to different types of transportation data um, and then from there it's really the beginning because once you have the data in one place you can start to build from there so I think it was you know just just full compliments to I think the, the cluster gave fantastic guidance as this project progressed um, you know and it was just neat to see the different um, the different team members from UPS from agility from all the different parts of um, of the of the LET working together on it, so um, so just great presentation and, and glad glad to see that, and I think even even more excited to see where this could go in the years ahead if we all keep building on getting the right data in the right place and then making priorities about what to do with it. Thank you, Mallory. Um, I'd like to also comment on that is uh, it was it was really great to watch the UPS team um, and the agility team working collaboratively on this, um, particularly the, on, on, the, on the data science side of UPS. And you know, in the background, we had two problems. We had a couple different problem statements on this project. And one of them was about you know, moving uh, cargo in and out of areas and looking at data. And it's a huge, it's a huge informational challenge. Um, and you know, UPS, they did some, some hard work on that, man. Uh, so that we, we, we've come up with a, with, with a really, really good tool as a foundation. Uh, we know that there's, there's more work to be done and we'll continue to work on it. Um, but um, the other thing I would like to say is again, a huge thanks to uh, David and the UPS volunteers, the data scientists who worked on this. Like there really was a lot of effort put into this, into this tool among other aspects of the project. And again, a thank you to Maria and Alan and the other uh, LET operational volunteers who participated in preparing, you know, getting all the, the scope and data sources identified. Um, and also a, a, another thank you to our, our colleagues at Google who provided free information for humanitarians. Uh, it's like it's tremendously valuable information that they're providing for free. So that's very, very good. Um, Alice, any other comments? There is a question in the chat about more countries being added in the future. And I, during um, IATA, we did add countries uh, to help get into the Central, Af the, the, um, Central America region to make sure that um, commodities could fly in. So we have the option to add countries as different disasters happen. Um, and we don't, the, the tool works faster with the less amount of countries in it. So we wanna make sure that we have the right countries in it at all times. So they can be adjusted. Yeah, th thanks Alice. And maybe just clarifying and, and, and adding to exactly what Alice is saying. So we're gonna to try to keep the tool as light as possible, obviously. And as Frank was also explaining, the tool is intended to give us a two week foresight, two week foresight. Uh, uh, mostly based on uh, uh, certain onset and unpredicted changes in, 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 in the situation we are, we are working on. So the idea would not be that this is a tool that people can do their six month planning with. That's not the purpose of the tool as it is configured now. Uh, so it's, it's, it's constantly going to be if, if we see hurricane season is coming up and we see how, how cyclones and hurricanes are, are, are developing, for instance, then we're going to be asking 
uh, the, the, the partners, the LED partners and, and the data providers uh, for, for updated information based on those countries and then other countries are going to be reducing. Uh, and then of course if there's, if there's you know, tsunami-like, uh, earthquake-like events, obviously we're going to, uh, well, uh, the entire LED and us, we are already on, 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 on the phone day and night anyhow, so obviously we're going to be uh, connecting those data immediately. And I hope that answers your question, Manuel. Excellent. Okay. Um, I, I think that concludes uh, the, the LET uh, presentation. I apologize. I have to jump on another call in a couple minutes anyways. Uh, but again, I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity for this. And again, thank you to my uh, UPS and agility colleagues who participated in this project. Thanks so much, Frank, and thanks so much to everybody. I'm a complete techno dinosaur, but I can see this as a massive quantum leap. And I'm having flashbacks to several years ago when I was sort of desperately making tens of, of phone calls to try and find solutions to get pre-positioned relief items out to unexpected locations. And thousands of hours being put in by the volunteers. So really a huge, huge thanks to everybody because it's gonna really save those vital minutes when we're trying to find solutions for an international response in a sudden an onset so really thank you so much to all of you who you technical gurus um, for all the thousands of hours that you've put into this it's really very exciting um, sea shift in how we, we we have this ability to access data where we need it so thanks a million and thanks for all the great presentations thanks everybody talk to you soon <laughs>